Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Danun Institute of Biblical Research. And this evening, I, I had mentioned to you that I would this weekend bring up uh, Daniel's uh, prophecy, Daniel chapter 9. And uh, because the Lord had dealt with me recently about Daniel chapter 9, and I wanted to share that with you guys there, what the Lord put on my heart. And, uh, and by the way, no, I'm not uh, in the camp of the futurist uh, that say, or, the, or excuse me, the, the, the camp that says that it's the futurist that only believe in a 70th week that is yet to be fulfilled and that the 70th week has been completely fulfilled. Uh, that's not what the Lord has dealt with me on. But let me share with you first the testimony about what happened to me so that you'll know where I'm coming from to start with. And then I'm going to take you directly into the Word of God and share with you the different passages that prove exactly what God has shown me as well. Anyway, it all began, and this happened back when we were still in the United States. Uh, I was uh, getting ready to do a video for a rabbi that has been watching our ministry now for, for quite some time. And uh, he had sent me several emails already, and uh, he lives in Israel, and uh, he had been watching very intently. And it was on my heart to do a video for him to help him recognize who the Messiah actually is. And uh, as I was getting ready to do the video on Daniel is where I wanted to go, was Daniel chapter 9. And as I began to start the video, I got started. I was reading Daniel 9. I was showing the 70th week. I was talking about the 70th week and how that it had yet to be fulfilled. And suddenly, the Lord just came so heavily upon me. And I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was. I didn't really think it was what I was teaching, but something was not right. And I knew the Lord did not want me to speak to him about Daniel's 70th week. And so I stopped the video, never published it, didn't even finish making the video. And then I went to the closet to pray. And I began to pray sincerely before the Lord. And I said, Father, what is it that about Daniel's 70th week that you don't want me to say? What, what is this? What am I missing, Lord? And while I was sitting there praying, I, I prayed very fervently before the Lord. And then I, I was finished praying. And I had, of all things, uh, one of the uh, scene gospels that I had printed out from online sitting uh, in a notebook right there on the shelf in the closet. And I started to, to, to reach up for it, and when I did, it fell into my hands before I could even touch it. And when it did, it opened up to, to a particular page. Now, what I'm about to share with you is something that has been written hundreds and hundreds of years ago, 2,000 years ago, in fact, by those that recorded the life of Yeshua in the Essene Gospel. Now, I realize there's a lot of different people who have different views on the Essene Gospel. Some are for it, some against it, some say it's uh, this or that, and, and that it wasn't really authenticated or whatsoever, or, or different opinions on that. Well, everyone has their opinion on that, but I will say one thing, in what I have seen thus far in a lot of the writings of the Essene Gospel, there's a lot of it that is very prophetic, speaking about our day, that is undeniably accurate in its prophecies. And of course, much of it lines up with the very Gospels that we read. The only thing is, is just maybe another sentence that got left out in what we read. So therefore, I find it very interesting, as we are Danun Institute of Biblical Research, a ministry that researches the Bible, researches texts, just like many of you believe in the Book of Enoch. Well, interestingly enough, in the Book of Enoch, the first part, part one of Enoch, is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Not part two and part three, but part one is. So I think it gives us more credence to believe that it is actually a good book to read. Not to mention, there is proven facts that the Essenes were the ones that actually had that early Bible, the oldest Bible that we have, a Bible that has not 150 Psalms, but 364 Psalms. Now keep that in mind, because we're going to come back to that here in just a little bit, but 364 Psalms, because why? The Essenes believed in what they called a solar calendar. Now, not like the Gregorian calendar, 365 and a quarter days in a year, but they believe in 364 days in the year. And David is quoted in those Psalms as saying that he wrote a Psalm for every day of the year. They also believe that Mount Zion was the holy mountain of God. Kind of interesting, especially since there are some uh, people pushing now that the temple was actually built there on Mount Zion. 
Well, if it is so, I kind of think it may have been built where David's tomb is today or supposed tomb or the site of the Last Supper of Yeshua. I mean, that's all speculation because we don't know for sure, but just some thoughts to share with you. But anyway, this Essene Gospel fell into my hands. And when I looked down to read it, it was the, about the crucifixion of Yeshua. And it stated there, and I have to paraphrase it because I don't have it with me. I think I, it was in the suitcase that got uh, held up on the airline there. I still haven't got that suitcase in yet. But anyway, it stated there, just paraphrasing it, that thus was fulfilled the scriptures. Not a bone in him was broken. And he was cut off in the midst of the week. Now that got my attention. In the midst of the week. It's referring to Daniel's prophecy of Daniel's 70th week. Not like some might conclude that it's actually speaking of the middle of the week that he was crucified in. That We know that doesn't seem to line up there. But they said it was the prophecy. He was cut off in the midst of the week. And I was blown away by this. That night, I did not sleep a single wink. I stayed up the rest of the night and I was in prayer before the Lord. And as I prayed and asked the Lord earnestly, because I knew that there were two schools of thoughts on this. And, and ironically, I know that there's some people that also believe that there's still three and a half years left to go. But the, the one group that believes that the 70th week of Daniel has already been fulfilled is actually a group that is still leaning towards a lot of the teachings of the church in early years. In fact, it was Hal Lindsey, from what my research has brought up, that is one that actually popularized the idea of the 70th week of Daniel being a future event that is yet to be fulfilled. And from him, Chuck Missler and others all picked up on this and they have taught this. This is not even taught in any of the earth history or documentation. Much of that documentation believes just the opposite. They either believe it's already been fulfilled or it's partially fulfilled. Well, according to the Essene Gospel of Yeshua, and I think that's in the Holy Twelve, if I remember it right, it is actually only half fulfilled. Well, as I prayed that night, sincerely before the Lord the entire night, and God began to lead me through the scriptures to prove that this was true. I want to share with you some of those facts that I was able to find as well. Let's first take a look at Daniel chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 20. We'll start with verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, by the way, Yeshua must fulfill all of those scriptures there. And some people that say, as the futurists say, that the 70th week of Daniel has already been fulfilled, it would be preposterous to say so. And why do we say that? Because this particular scripture here says it finishes the transgression and makes an end of sin and make reconciliation for iniquity. Yeshua has not made an end of sin for the Jews yet. And it's determined on the Jewish people. It had nothing to do with the Gentiles. It was concerning Daniel and his people. See, uh, for 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, he's speaking of Daniel, the Jews, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. So something is not yet finished because why? That transgression and that sin and that reconciliation for iniquity has yet to be fulfilled. That's Zechariah's prophecy chapter 12 where it speaks about in Zechariah that they will look upon him whom they pierced and they will separate each one to their own family and they will weep and mourn as a family did for days. Saying, oh my gosh, the, the house of David and the house of Nathan apart, which is the tribe of Judah, the house of Benjamin, Benjamin apart, uh, the ben or Shemai apart, which is he is a Benjamite, the house of Levi, and the their families and wives apart, which is the, the tribe of Levi, and the families that remained, which were the Samaritans. 
God does say that he'll bring the house of Judah home first, that they do not lift up against the house of Israel. Why? Because it was the house of Judah that convicted and killed Yeshua in the first place. So they have to come home first. And therefore, that second half of the three and a half years, or the 70th week of Daniel, that last week, is still to be fulfilled. Remember now, let's, take, or let's first look at the rest of the verse here. Let's go to verse 25. Now, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now, I always took that literally, that as soon as that 69th week ended, he would be cut off. But when you begin to look at it a little deeper, we realize that it's not literally at the end of that 69th week, but it's after the 69th week he's cut off. So he can be cut off anywhere, a day, a week, a month, a year, or three and a half years. And we know that Yeshua's ministry was three and a half years. Pardon me, I, I have no air conditioner. I have an air conditioner here, but I can't have it on because it makes too much noise in this room here. So anyway, forgive me for that. Uh, just very hot in here. So anyway, uh, he says here, uh, so the prince is cut off after that time. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now that is the Antichrist or the Antichristo. And it clearly identifies that he is a Roman, the prince that shall come. See? All right. Now watch what it says here, though. The city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now watch what he says here. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now it's referring back to Yeshua. And you see it was Yeshua. See, we, we've been, the whole doctrines of eschatology and everything have been totally revamped and rewritten here in modern times. The early Christians all the way up until the time of, uh, of, the, of the 20th century never believed that the 70th week of Daniel wasn't at least partially fulfilled. Like I said, Hal Lindsey, maybe his father Gordon Lindsay, was one of the ones that popularized this particular teaching. Now, let me just stay, show you this here, though. It's very interesting. I say Gordon Lindsay's his father. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, it says here that, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, that's, we're, we've always, we've been thinking here for the last 60, 70 years since this got really popularized that this is dealing with the Antichrist because the Antichrist is clearly in verse 26, the prince that shall come. But the covenant is the renewed covenant that Yeshua made. And he does cut off the sacrifice, sacrificial service in the midst of the week. Because why? Now there's many of you that I know that you guys don't like it when I quote Jeremiah's prophecy in chapter 7 where, uh, and let me just, I got to bring this up to you again. Uh, and, and let me tell you something, friends. I mean, uh, there's all kinds of rumors going on about Brother Steve now because I'm willing to, to, to speak out about something. But do you have any idea how many people spoke out against the sacrificial service in our own Bible? I know that in the Essene Gospel, Yeshua speaks out against it as well. But Yeshua spoke out of it against it in the book that we have as well, in the book of Matthew. What is it? The, I believe the 13th chapter. I'll take you to it in just a minute. But let me show you. In, in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 22, as you guys are well familiar, I've already brought it up, for I spake not unto your fathers, let me back up to verse 21. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings into your sacrifices and, and eat flesh. It don't even make sense reading it that way. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. Jeremiah says that God never spoke to our fathers about that. 
Well, you know, I did a little research, and when I researched it and everything, it's kind of interesting. You know, in Malachi chapter 4, when God speaks about the sacrifices here, do you know that in, in, in Malachi, in chapter 4, let me just take you to this real quick, because we're going to come back to Jeremiah in a minute. I want to show you something else in Jeremiah. And by the way, those that don't believe that God spoke in, in our own Bible, Hosea speaks about God not wanting sacrifice and offerings. David speaks about it. Uh, uh, many, many scriptures. And, and so we have to wonder, how did this all come out? Because here Jeremiah is challenging that God never spoke about it. Well, that was kind of interesting because I was looking the other day, the Lord put it on my heart, go to, go to Malachi. And I went back to Malachi. And this is where it speaks about the coming of Elijah. Now, Yeshua does apply part of that verse to John the Baptist. I agree with that. He does. But he only applies half of verse uh, 6 to John. It says, excuse me, uh, yes, uh, and, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. What fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What was their heart? Well, the seed of Abraham was the Messiah. The fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all looked for the coming of the Messiah. Their heart was the coming of the Messiah. What did John do? Turn the children of Israel to the heart of the, of the fathers. But the problem is, Israel, it wasn't in their heart to receive the Messiah. But Elijah and Yeshua never uh, attributes the next part of this verse to, to John, but it says, and, and turn the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So Elijah's got to come and turn the children, Israel's heart, to the fathers, which is the desire, the desire to see the coming of the Messiah. And see, that's yet to come to pass. Now just hang on one second. Bear with me just a second. So John, uh, excuse me, John fulfills that first part, but he doesn't fulfill the second part. So Elijah must come. And according to Yeshua, he actually says that uh, when he comes down from Mount Transfiguration, he speaks about how that Elijah, when they ask him the question, doesn't the scribe say that Elias must first come, which is Greek for Elijah. And he says, truly, Elijah shall first come and restore all things. Now, Yeshua, we would think, restored all things. Now, John the Baptist is dead when he actually makes this statement. But what is it? The gospel gets so far off. we got so many different denominations, so many different ideas out there that God has to send Elijah again along with Moses as one of the two witnesses in order to restore back his word again. Now, the, the funny thing is, and, and, and let me just share this here with you. I've, I've shared this with you before. This is like the equivalent here in the Essene Gospel of Matthew 24. But um, he says here in the, in, the, in the section called Yeshua gives a sign of the end of wickedness. And it's, it's just Matthew 24. But where we read the part in Matthew 24 about, and, and this, this gospel shall be preached into all the earth, then the end will come. He says here, but the eternal spirit of all shall send forth his holy messengers, and they shall restore the holy law anew. Now, what law are we talking about? We're not talking about 613 commandments that the Jews have written down in the Talmud. And by the way, that 613 that many of you asked me about, you know, should we keep these here? Those aren't even written in the Torah. There's only about a hundred if you count Leviticus and books uh, like this here. But Jeremiah says it's, it's not even there, that God never commanded these things in the first place. So I was reading here, going back to Malachi, and in the fourth, let me just start the whole book here. For behold, the day, or the last chapter, fourth chapter, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as the oven and, and, and the proud, and yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that shall need, leave them neither root nor branch. That means they're going to be flat out tore up, you know. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Son of righteousness. Do you know? Now, of course, that's S-U-N, but do you know that the Essenes were called the sons of righteousness? Or, the, excuse me, the sons, sons, of, sons of light and as the sons of darkness. That doesn't even matter there, I guess. I, anyway, just a thought there. I'll just throw that out there. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. 
and you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. When? When he comes to preach. So this is clearly one of the two witnesses. Now, I know there's people I already believe. I've had people write me about different people they believe that was the Elijah. Some people believe that there is a black man in, in South uh, in Africa that is Elijah or that he's Moses. And I, I don't agree with these things, especially, I mean, there's several different religions, including, um, uh, I, won't, I, won't, I wouldn't be nice to call names, but anyway, there are several different groups that believe that Elijah has already come. One is part from the Pentecostal movement. Another one is uh, from, from the uh, Church of God. I believe they believe that Elijah had already came, uh, and, and several different groups like that. Uh, and, and In fact, uh, uh, Reverend Branham is another one that they believe that he was the Elijah that came for this day. But the problem is it doesn't match the Word of God, because why? The earth did not burn up during that time, and the restoration of the Word has still yet to happen. Part of restoration of God's Word is restoring women back to where it was like it was when Yeshua was here. Even in the, even in the uh, Clementine homilies, it speaks about Yeshua and Paul, that they were the most liberating men of their day. And I've already shared with you how they have twisted the words of Paul, and Paul knew they were going to do that, say things that Paul never said. Okay, so anyway, it just, it's just, you know, it's, it's not happened as of yet. And especially the idea of animals. Now, I know a lot of the people don't like this when I speak about, you know, we shouldn't take the life of an animal. I'm only, listen to me, friends. You know, true, the Bible says he put them into our hand to do as, as we will. But you realize that when we read the scripture and it speaks about that future day coming, the millennial reign, there will be no death, no, 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 nothing will harm in all of his holy mountain. The lion will lay down with the, with the lamb. They shall not kill. We're not going to be killing them and eating them either. You know, so if you choose to do this, just I look at like in the time of Moses when God said, I'm giving you a land flowing with milk and honey. He never said nothing about the rams, goats, and, and things like that. In fact, he condemned the children of Israel when they wanted to, the fish. Get it? The fish they wanted. And, and, and God was angry with them, not over the melons, not over the garlic from Egypt, but he said, because your, your lust for blood. You see, why? God was trying to restore his people back to the original word. It's not that he won't allow it. Then he gave them the quail. He allowed them to eat it. He said, you'll eat it till it comes out your nose and out your mouth and out your ears. Imagine that. See, but what I'm sharing with you, friends, when I bring these things out, this is what God's original word is. It's what it was in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they were, they were created. Genesis clearly shows us they were given the fruits of the trees to eat. The animals were given the grass vegetation to eat. They were none of them. There was no killing there. And that's the way we're going back to. You know, if you choose to, to live the lifestyle of, of animals, that's up to you. You know, but... You know, my heart has a, I, I just have a heart for animals. I love them. Because, you know, and some people used to say, the old Baptists say that no animal doesn't have a soul. That's a lie. You don't see it in your writing there, but in Genesis, God says they have nephesh chai. They were a living soul. The animals have a soul. They have a nephesh. It's God, God wrote it in there. Anything that has blood in it has a soul. So that, that's why it matters to me. It matters to me and to my family here as far as that. But, you know, the thing is, is because we're trying to show and, and bring some of these things out, don't condemn us for that. You know, I'm only sharing with you that perfect desire of God. Because when we get to the millennium, that's what it's going to be anyway. You know, so, but I'm not condemning you. If, if you feel differently, I, I don't condemn that. I know there's passages that we'll find written in the Bible, King James, no matter what it is, New Living, whatever, it's all written that way too. But, you know, if you go back to the historical side of it, we find out in the early church and everything, they were, they were vegetarians before the Catholic, before Constantine got a hold of it. They were people like that. Anyway, that's a different subject altogether. And I, and I don't want to, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings or nothing. I'm just sharing these things here because it's important. All right, now, here's what he says, though. He says in verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him 
in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. And I thought, the stat, you know, I used to wonder, why did God put this in here when he's talking about Elijah? Well, it's because he's going to send Moses and Elijah. Well, you know, the funny thing is, do you know where this is actually written at? This is written in Deuteronomy. And so when you go back to Deuteronomy, if you want to find out when God brings down the law, the one place it records, because see, the, here's what's kind of awkward. In the Bible that we have, we have here written that the Ten Commandments come from Mount Sinai, and then in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 5, it says that the, the Ten Commandments come from Mount Horeb that Moses brought him down from Mount Horeb. Well the, well, the funny thing is, when you read over here in Deuteronomy in chapter 5, I went through this just to make dead sure. Do you know that we don't get any of the other laws that have been written in the book of Leviticus, or even Exodus for that matter? Now, I'm just, I'm just stating this to you as a, as, a, as a question. I can't answer this. I don't know why. I don't know why that we have in one book one thing and another book and another thing. But Jeremiah seems to suggest that nowhere... Now, I don't say that, that God didn't end up giving Moses a bunch of other rules and regulations to give to the people afterwards, but originally, and I think that's what Jeremiah is bringing us to, originally, when Moses came down, he came down with Ten Commandments and Ten Commandments only from Mount Horeb. And Elijah, is in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 4, God reminds, and this is doing, doing for the ministry of Moses and Elijah, reminds of the statutes and judgments that are brought down on the mountain of Horeb. And perhaps this has to do with the fact that God wants us to keep the Ten Commandments as well. And by the way, the statutes that he includes with those Ten Commandments is the Lord thy God is one, and you shall love your, your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Just what Yeshua brings out as well. But, we find the Ten Commandments there. It's exactly what he brings out. It's in chapter 5, verse 7, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse 8, Thou shalt not make thee any graven images. That's the second commandment. Third commandment is in verse 11, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. By the way, the second one the, the Catholic Church took out. Thank you, Pope Francis. Appreciate you changing that one. Of course, people say it was already done. Okay, I appreciate that too, but still, nonetheless, it's fulfilling biblical scripture or biblical prophecy. Uh, verse 12, Keep the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's the fourth commandment. I don't know why we want to take that out. I guess we could take out thou shalt not murder too. A lot of people don't like it when I bring up the, uh, the, 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 the Sabbath. Okay, but anyway, in verse 16, out of thy father and thy mother. Uh, that's the fifth commandment. Verse 17, thou shalt not kill. Sixth commandment, not, uh, seventh commandment, neither shalt thou commit adultery. And uh, verse 19 is the eighth commandment, neither shalt thou steal. Uh, and also verse 20 as the ninth commandment, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. And uh, uh, verse 21 is the tenth commandment, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither thy, shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house. And it goes on. It goes into more detail, okay? But verse 22 is the important verse. I want you to get this. And this is why I believe Jeremiah said what he said. Verse 22 says, these words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount of your midst in the fire of the cloud in the thick darkness and with a great voice and he added no more. And Jeremiah said God didn't command sacrifice. He didn't command the, the sacrificial service that we have. Now, I'm just telling you what it says here. Now, you have to take that up with God because I, I, can't go, I can't say any more. Now, when you get to the statutes, that's in chapter 6. And here's the statutes, verse 4 and verse 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto the children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for the sign upon thine hand, and thou shalt be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and upon on thy gates. Believe me, you could fit these on the post of your house and on the doorpost and on the gate, and you could actually bind it on your hand and between your forehead. See? But if you had to do the 613, they're not going to fit very well, are they? They won't. You'd have to have a mighty big door. Anyway, so 
Jeremiah, was he wrong in saying that? I don't believe he was. How the other part come into being? Now, I'm not going to argue that. That's that's, I, I can't say it. David says in the psalm, Psalm chapter 51, sacrifice, uh, you know, the, the God, well, let me take you to it real quick. I just got, uh, you know, I'm just trying to show you because we're dealing with Daniel's 70th week. There's a reason for all this, so just bear with me. Psalm chapter 51. Uh, there's, there's, there's so many that say this, you would not even believe it. I, I don't understand it. Unless it's God's permissive will or whatever, I don't understand. Anyway, David says here in the 51st, let's see. Um, mm, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Um, wait a minute, that's not, oh gosh, I thought I had it marked in here. I don't. But anyway, he says, uh, he speaks about uh, offering sacrifice, and he said, had he, if God had commanded, he would have done it. He says, but you have not required that. And I, I don't have my notes in front of me for that. Anyway, let's go back to, 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 Jer to Jeremiah, though, one more time. I want to share with you something here again. Um, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there the word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah that enter in at, the, at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust you not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Uh, are these, for if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you... Uh, Execute judgment between a man and his neighbor if you oppress not the stranger and the fatherless and the widow and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt. Then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I give to your fathers forever and ever. Now, by the way, God sends Jeremiah into the door, into at the gate of the temple in Jerusalem to declare this. And he mentions the in, shedding of the innocent blood. Now, again, we're looking at Daniel chapter 9, the 70th week, because I'm telling you that Yeshua was cut off in the midst of the week, and his job in the midst of that week was cut off the sacrifice and oblation. Let's, let's prove that. Let's take a look at this. Let's, take a, let's go ahead and prove that. Now, I mentioned to you that it's in Matthew chapter 12. It's another one. All right. Now, this one here says, But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Do you know in the Hebrew Matthew, Howard's Hebrew Matthew, you can get a PDF of that online and read it yourself, the same verse, he says here, but if you had not known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not have bound the innocent. Imagine that. You would have not have bound the innocent. It's in the masculine plural. He's speaking of the sacrificial order. And of course, it's the bulls, it's the goats, the males, the, fir the firstlings. Bringing the males, and I know there's females as well, but the main sacrifice is like, like Israel's doing now, the red heifer, it's not of God. You know, God's house is to be a house of prayer, not a house of bloodshed. And Jesus came and stopped those sacrifices. And he said, if you knew what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not have condemned the guiltless. The guiltless were the animals they were slaughtering. And this is what Jesus is doing when he puts an end to the sacrifices in the temple. All right, now what did he do? Another thing that Jesus does. Let me pull this up for you real quick. You know, uh, the book of John is the best one for this too, by the way. John chapter 2, verse 14. And found in, uh, let's back up. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers of money and overthrew the tables. See, he stopped that sacrificial service. Now that day there, he, he drove the animals out. 
If you look in the Essene Gospel there, they actually speak of, you know, it's, it's, he goes a lot deeper in it there. He clearly says that he come to put a stop to the sacrifices. Now, no doubt after Yeshua did this, they continued to do their sacrifice, sacrificial service. But at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, there was no more sacrifices being offered in the temple. He put an end to the sacrificial service. Now we can argue all day long. It's written in the book of Numbers. It's written in the book of Exodus. It's written in the book of Leviticus. As many places we see a sacrificial service. But the thing is, according to Jeremiah, God never commanded that. How did this get into being? Is it a permissive will of God? Perhaps so. You know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of different opinions on that. When we look at some of the other books, like even the book of Adam and Eve, you know, some people that say this is just a book of fiction. Well, you know, it lines up with a lot of things. I'll tell you this. I can't say the authenticity of it. It was written about 200 years before Yeshua came. And some of these books, by the way, are part of the Essene Bible. Part of the Essene Bible. You'd be surprised. The book of Enoch, as I said before, is part of the Essene Bible. You know, in fact, the book of Enoch says that eating of meat was taught by the fallen angels. Figure that one out. You know, so, but there again, I know all the different arguments. So, you know, if you want to make the comment, you make it, but I already know these arguments on both sides of the fence. But I'm telling you, Yeshua came and fulfilled half of that week, and the other half is still yet to be fulfilled. It also lines up with Isaiah 61. Yeshua comes in, he opens up the scrolls, and he reads in Isaiah 61. Let's take a look at that. All right. And it says this here, and by the way, for sake of time, it's already like 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning, my time here. So I won't have time to edit in the scriptures for you. So please forgive me for that. I, I would do it, but it's just for the sake of time. Um, Isaiah 61, he, Yeshua reads this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings and the meek, and he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Halfway in the verse, he stops, he closes the scroll, and he said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all the eyes were fastened upon him when he read it. Half the verse, why? Because he was cut off in half the week. And also, half of his ministry was fulfilled. That's the covenant for one week is the covenant he makes with Israel. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Then he turns back to the Jews. There's three and a half years still left for the Jewish people. That's what's about to happen. I know there's a lot of you, especially those of you that believe in pre-trib rapture and stuff like that. You're, you're, all, you're probably freaking out on me right now, Brother Steve. I thought there was a rapture going to come. I do, there is a rapture coming. I believe that 100%. But I've always told you, God spares us of His judgment, not man's. Do we think it's right for all the Christians to be murdered all over the world? And the American people, we just get to walk by on a red bed of flower, bed of ease, and get to walk up into heaven and go enjoy the life and everything, and nothing happens to us. There is a rapture coming. And I shared recently with you guys, and I know it, it upsets some of the people that I shared this with. And please understand, brother, sister, I, I want the rapture to come. I wish it came uh, seven years ago, five years ago, three years ago, whatever the case may be. I wish it had already came. But the problem is we're not ready. All right, so there's still three and a half years. Isn't it interesting that Moses and Elijah, according to Revelation 11, preach three and a half years? Now, not three and a half years according to the 364 days in a year calendar that the Dead Sea Scrolls contained in their calendar. But according to the lunar calendar, it's three and a half years, which always perplexed me. This is one of the reasons why I also lean towards the 70th week of Daniel being a future event that not, had not yet been fulfilled. But then the Lord showed me something else that was beautiful as well that night when I was up the entire night praying. And that is 
that the calendar is 364 days in a year. And if you take the time that Moses and Elijah preached according to the lunar calendar, because I used to say, well, then it has to be that they come at the first half because God has to destroy the earth. And there's time already up, so he can't destroy it yet. So I figured, okay, they do the first half. The second half is God's judgment. Wrong. You think people could survive the judgment of God for three and a half years? There ain't no way. There's no way you could handle it. But when does that judgment come? All right, brother, sister. Their bodies lay in the street for three and a half days. Isn't that right? Three and a half days. So, if you take that three years, and there's four days actually longer per year, you have about a, a dozen or so days, maybe a little bit more. Well, take four days off of that because of their death of their bodies laying in the street for three and a half days as what as a testimony. What do they lay there for? They're giving, they're bearing record that their testimony of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection was the truth. And not only that, they're also, because God raises them up, that shows that their ministry was ordained of Almighty God Himself. But then you have about a week or a little over a week left. Maybe eight to ten days left. Well, I happen to be reading I think, it, I want to say it was the Apocalypse of Abraham, another one of these books here. And when it speaks in that book there, it speaks about, and it could have been the Apocalypse of Thomas, I forget which one it was. It speaks about the number of days that God pours out the judgment on this earth. Where it speaks about what we have in our Bible, they cried out, let the rocks fall on us and hide us from him that is to come. Where it speaks about the heaven will part like a scroll. All these judgments begin to fall upon this earth and upon those that rejected the ministry of Moses and Elijah. And it's written in the Essene Gospel that he will send his angels and they will gather up his elect and will hide them until what? The wrath of God is passed. They fulfill Yeshua's other half of his ministry. Because it's the Holy Spirit in them. It's Christ in them fulfilling the other half. of Because the, 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 the covenant is for one week. One week to who? Daniel said, God said, the angel said to Daniel, to, to your people and to Jerusalem. So Micah 4, they go back to Mount Zion, but they have to go out and dwell in the fields. Uh, all these things that are happening. But see, God is not allowing the covenant to Israel to be fulfilled until the two witnesses come on the scene. So see, that last half of the 70th week of Daniel doesn't start until the witnesses come on the scene. When do they come on the scene? We're about to see it. Because why? They got plans for the third temple already. And according to Revelation, he said, take a measuring reed likened to a rod and measure the temple and measure the city. I believe that you're seeing the beginning of the scripture of Revelation 11 being fulfilled. Two witnesses are about to come on the scene. And bless God, they're not just coming for the Jews. They're coming to get the Gentiles in order as well. Because why? The Gentile church is not ready. She's not without spot or wrinkle. She's caught up in every wind of doctrine that there is on the planet. And you ju I just read to you from the Essene where Yeshua said, I'll send my holy messengers and they will restore the holy law. What law? The law that Christ come to write on your heart. It should be in your heart not to kill. It should be in your heart to keep the Sabbath. Not that you have to. It should be in your heart not to covet your neighbor's wife. It should be in your heart not to steal. Not to commit adultery. These things should be in your heart. And so my friend, after I've seen these things here, I knew then that I had taught this incorrectly. But you know what's funny? At one time, I used to believe it that way. I used to believe there was only three and a half years. Now, for an interesting point I might add too, remember that the scripture says that, Paul says that, we which are alive and remain shall not hint 
hinder nor prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord, the, the dead in the Lord will the dead in Christ shall rise first. I'm just paraphrasing. And we which remain shall meet, we shall ride, we'll go with them and meet the Lord in the air. Here, sometime maybe a couple of years ago, I actually spoke about that one day, and I said, I wonder if the dead in Christ. The two witnesses may represent that resurrection. Can't say it's so, because we do, I do know that the rest of the dead in Christ will rise as well. Clearly it says it. Even the apocalypse of Abraham speaks about he'll raise up all the dead. And they'll be caught up. The angels will literally go and gather their bodies wherever they are on the earth, and the souls will be joined with them, and they'll be changed in the moment, twinkling of an eye like we read in our Bible. We shall meet the Lord in the air. He'll hide us away. But both Jew and Gentile will hear the message of the two witnesses. Because God's got to restore the pure word, the pure gospel. And even like these, these issues or these questions that we have. You know, some people say, well, there's no contradictions in the Bible. I, I would love to say that myself. But I have to be honest and truthful. You know, it seemed odd that Paul would have these sisters following him in his ministry, but then would tell them to shut up. They can't speak. That seemed odd, didn't it, sisters? But as we researched and dug deep, we found out that just like Jesus came to set what? The captives free. What is the gospel? Setting free those that are imprisoned. Imprisoned by doctrines, denominational differences, and everything else. And then they say that, oh, the man is the head of the house. He's, you know, we believe in the headship doctrine. Does that mean then when your husband, that you're going to have to obey him, that when he leads you to a false doctrine, to a, a cult like Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that, that as long as you obey your husband, you'll be saved? No, God doesn't save you, sister, based on whether or not you obey your husband. God saves you on whether or not you believe Yeshua to be the Messiah. And he doesn't save you, sisters, because you can birth babies. That just that should have been that should have been common sense. Oh, you shall be saved in childbirth. Excuse me, brother, don't you even have enough sense to know that women birthing children is not the way of salvation, is through Jesus Christ and Him alone? Through the repented heart of the sinner? That's the way of salvation. Anyway, I trust this has been a blessing. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. You know, I love the Bible that we have. But I'm very concerned about, what about the, the things that have been hidden from us? And, I, and just like the Bible here, we see that there's been issues in the translation. It's not, it's not the prophets that spoke it. It's not Moses. It's not Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, and, and Isaiah, and all these other prophets. It's what they tampered with it with. Why did Isaiah say in chapter 66 to kill an ox as if you killed a man? He was prophesying of them building the third temple. God has no problem with the third temple if it's a house of prayer. He would never condemn the third temple being built if it was used as a house of prayer. But remember, ye are the temple of God. Isn't it interesting? The Lord brought this to my heart just yesterday. I was thinking about how Jesus was talking to his disciples. Or not to his disciples, talking to the Pharisees. He said, you are like whited sepulchers. He said, outwardly, you look real good. But inwardly, you're full of dead man's bones. Then I noticed that in the... Bible, in the King James, the word men's, M-E-N apostrophe S, is a, was uh, italicized. So I looked at it in the original Hebrew, excuse me, in the original Greek. It doesn't say dead men's bones. It just says, you are filled with dead bones. Then I took a little peek into the Essene Gospel because it matches up, same verses and everything. It just says you're full of dead things. Now see, we are the temple of God. And he was typing the Pharisees 
to the temple where the Holy of Holies dwelt. And he, and he shows that they were like a grave. On the outside it looked good, but the inside they're full of the dead. That ought to make people think, what do you think? Mm. Anyway, God bless you guys. We love you. Stand with us in this ministry. We need your support now than more than ever. And by the way, not only do we need your support, Brother Kellen, with, with, um, with the ministry that he, or the, the, the meeting that he's put together in September the 16th through the 18th, reconciliationwithisrael.com. Look up his website. You know, it doesn't take a lot there. If you can just give a little bit there towards helping cover the cost of the venue there. That brother has opened it up with several, quite a few speakers there. He's asked me and my wife to speak there. We'll be speaking there. In fact, you always want to do something for Israel. That's one thing you can. There's going to be a lot of Orthodox Jews at this meeting. So it's 700 people and over half of them will be Jews. And God has given me the opportunity to speak to my people publicly. If you can take and contribute a little bit towards the cost of the venue there, it'd be greatly appreciated. And again, remember us in this ministry here. The more that I stand for truth, the less people want to support. But would you rather me just tickle your ears like all the other pastors do in the world? Or do you want me to tell you the truth? I love you. I feel obligated to tell you what's truth because I do love you. You could go to IsraelReturns.com. There's a place to donate. Also in the contact section is our address in Florida where Sister Lisa helps us with that there. Pray about it and see how the Lord leads you. We need your help in doing so, especially in September. Before the Pope of Rome and the, and the United Nations destroy Israel, we're going to have a chance. We're going there. It's a, it's a conference against anti-Semitism towards the Jews. But we're going there to reveal to the Jewish people how Pope Francis has fulfilled biblical prophecy and how that Yeshua is the true Messiah. Please support. Support the venue. ReconciliationWithIsrael.com Support the work we're doing. We need your help. It's very expensive when we're in Israel. We need your help in this. God bless you and Shalom.